Before Dr. Andelin presents some clinical cases of diarrhea, I wanted to remind you of what you have already previously learned about the pathogenesis of many of these organisms and how that impacts how patients present clinically. Hopefully you recognize this slide. In brief review, enteric organisms that do not invade the bowel wall, like enterotoxigenic E. coli and Vibrio cholera, present with a watery diarrhea. Those that invade into the epithelium, including enterohemorrhagic and enteroinvasive E. coli, along with Shigella, create bloody diarrhea. And finally, those that both invade the bowel but also are introduced into the lymph nodes and or bloodstream can present with additional symptomatology, such as severe abdominal pain or pseudoappendicitis, like seen with Yersinia intercolitica. Now that we have refreshed these ideas, let's start with the clinical cases. In this series of scenarios, we will be discussing common causes of bloody diarrhea. In our first case, we have a four-year-old female who has three days of diarrhea that began watery and then turned bloody with associated mucus. She's having small volume but frequent stools. Her illness began with fever for several days. She has associated abdominal pain. Several other children and some adults at her daycare are experiencing similar symptoms, some of whom have watery and some with bloody diarrhea. This is a case of dysentery caused by Shigella. The classic presentation of Shigella begins with watery diarrhea that turns bloody and mucoid. This can be referred to as dysentery or invasive diarrhea. Dysentery is defined by Harrison's as a clinical syndrome of fever, intestinal cramps, and frequent passage of small bloody mucopurulent stools. Shigella can also lead to tenesmus, which is the sensation of needing to defecate, although there's no passage of stool. The incubation time or time from exposure to onset of symptoms is typically one to three days. In most cases, symptoms resolve within about a week. Shigella is spread through fecal oral transmission, often through contaminated food or potentially through inadequate sewage disposal. As well as contaminated water being a concerning source, raw vegetables such as lettuce are a common source of transmission. Because the infectious dose or amount of bacteria needed to cause infection is low, Shigella can also be spread from person to person. In the United States, it can occur in daycares or other crowded or urban areas. These can include nursing home residents. Shigella tends to be more common and more severe in resource-limited countries, so you may see a case of Shigella present in a migrant worker or a traveler from Africa or another resource-limited area. As we begin to talk more in depth, about the microbiology of diarrhea, I wanted to give you a simplified flowchart for the enteric enterobacteraceae organisms that we will cover. Note that the enteric bacteria are bolded. The enterobacteraceae are a family of rod-shaped gram-negative bacteria with many causing gastrointestinal disease. The first branch point of differentiation is whether or not the bacteria ferment lactose. Notably, Escherichia coli is a lactose fermenter. Lactose fermenters can be identified on McConkey auger, a differential auger which turns pink when lactose is fermented, but stays yellow when the colonies do not ferment lactose. Note that some lactose fermenters slowly or weakly ferment lactose giving a very mild color change, whereas others, like E. coli, rapidly ferment lactose, giving a vibrant color change to the auger. Here we see a fast lactose fermenter, which would be consistent with E. coli. Now in non-lactose fermenting colonies, the production of hydrogen sulfide gas by the organism can help distinguish salmonella from the non-salmonella producing bacteria, such as Shigella and Yersinia intercolitica. Of course, there are many, many biochemical tests other than these that are used to distinguish the Enterobacteraceae bacteria from each other. But as far as the enteric, gastrointestinal disease causing Enterobacteraceae, these tests are key. The clinical case just presented was that of Shigella, and based on this flowchart, we see that Shigella does not ferment lactose, 
and does not produce hydrogen sulfide gas. Shigella is non-modal as it lacks flagella. Per the flowchart on the last slide, it does not ferment lactose like E. coli or produce hydrogen sulfide gas like salmonella. There are four major pathogenic species in humans with Shigella dysentery being the most virulent while Shigella sanii is the most common in the United States. Shigella causes disease by invading the cells lining the colon and Shigella dysentery causes severe disease through production of shigatoxin. Shigatoxin inhibits the 60S ribosomal subunit and this mechanism of action is good to know as it is the same as that seen with enterohemorrhagic E. coli strains, especially the shigalite toxin producing strain E. coli 0157. In our next scenario, we have a 26 year old male with diarrhea. He recently acquired some new turtles as pets. His diarrhea began as watery, however, he developed some mucus and a small amount of blood in his stool. He does have associated nausea with abdominal pain and some fever. His diarrhea resolves within about a week. This is a case of salmonella, specifically non-typhoidal salmonella. Infections from non-typhoidal salmonella can range from asymptomatic to severe, and the greater amount of bacteria ingested, the more severe the illness tends to be. Often there's watery diarrhea that can include mucus and a trace amount of blood. Additionally, patients may have fever, abdominal pain, and nausea. The incubation period is usually about one to three days with symptoms often lasting about a week, similar to Shigella. Salmonella is commonly spread through foodborne sources, including raw eggs and poultry, such as in raw cookie dough or raw chicken. This is a common source of foodborne outbreaks. Additionally, it can be spread from direct contact with animals, such as reptiles or amphibians, as well as live poultry. Turtles are commonly cited as a potential source. Salmonella has a higher infectious dose than Shigella, meaning it requires a larger amount of bacteria ingested to lead to infection. Let's contrast our first salmonella case to this one in which we have a 26-year-old male with diarrhea and fever. He returned from a trip to Thailand about five weeks ago, having not undergone any vaccinations in preparation for his travel. Now, over the last two weeks, our patient has developed a fluctuating fever that rises during the day and then seems to drop in the morning. He's also having headache. For one week, he's been having abdominal pain located in the right lower quadrant as well as diarrhea. Additionally, he's noticed a rash with red spots on his trunk. Lastly, he's now starting to have blood in his stool. This is a case of typhoid fever caused by Salmonella typhi. Note the difference in presentation here compared to our patient with non-typhoidal Salmonella. Hopefully you remember from MOD about typhoid fever, also known as enteric fever, that's caused by Salmonella typhi. This typically has a longer incubation period of seven to 14 days, which is longer than that of non-typhoidal Salmonella and can lead to serious progressive illness over a period of several weeks. The symptoms of typhoid fever are a reflection of intestinal invasion that can lead to bacteremia and organ seeding. Symptoms typically begin with fever that's referred to as stepwise and that it rises and falls, giving rise to troughs and peaks. Patients also frequently have headache. Patients can start to develop abdominal pain that may be either right lower quadrant or diffuse. Additionally, they can get rose spots, which are faint erythematous macules on the trunk, a result of bacterial emboli. There may be either constipation or diarrhea. Ultimately, patients can develop gastrointestinal bleeding, intestinal perforation, and potentially death. Some patients that recover, like the famous typhoid Mary from the early 1900s, can go on to become chronic carriers of salmonella typhi, harboring the bacteria in their gallbladder. Unlike non-typhoidal salmonella that can spread through animal contact, salmonella typhi is only spread person to person through fecal oral route, typically through contaminated food or water. This can occur in overcrowded areas and in areas that lack access to proper sanitation. While not common in the United States, you should consider this in an individual who's traveled to areas where it's endemic, such as South Central or Southeast Asia and Southern Africa. Luckily, there is a vaccine available to those living in or traveling to areas where Salmonella typhi is endemic. Salmonella species are gram-negative modal rods with flagella. One memory device to remember this fact is that salmon swim. Now, although salmonella does not ferment lactose like E. coli, they do produce hydrogen sulfide gas.
Here is XLD agar, which differentially indicates bacterial colonies that produce hydrogen sulfide as black colonies. Of the Salmonella species, Salmonella typhi is responsible for typhoid fever, while non-typhoidal serotypes present only with bloody diarrhea without the findings typical of typhoid fever. It should be noted, however, that Salmonella paratyphi can also cause typhoid symptomatology, but results in a less severe infection than Salmonella typhi. Salmonella has many virulence factors, including the ability to adhere and invade into enterocytes and even produce an enterotoxin. The ability to adhere and invade allow this bacteria to penetrate the small intestinal mucus layer and traverse the intestinal epithelium into overlying Peyer's patches. That being said, the key virulence factor that is most board relevant and that I really want you to know is the fact that the organism is encapsulated and in Salmonella typhi, the VI capsular antigen helps cause disease. Specifically, the VI capsular antigen prevents neutrophils from phagocytizing Salmonella typhi, but interacts with macrophages in such a way to allow for facultative intracellular survival within the macrophage. Finally, Salmonella typhi can aggregate together to produce a biofilm formation around gallstones, which facilitates long-term chronic gallbladder carriage, allowing for a chronic carrier state with reinfection or infectious passage in the stool to others. A complication of chronic salmonella infection is the development of gallbladder carcinoma, or cholangiocarcinoma. This is due to chronically inflamed gallbladder epithelium. In general, when there is long-term chronic inflammation, there is increased risk for neoplasia. Another complication in salmonella infections is infectious osteomyelitis and bacteremia. Individuals with sickle cell anemia have a greater propensity for such infections. The mechanism behind such infection is due to hyposplenism and or splenic infarction caused by the sickle cell anemia, which makes the body unable to fight off encapsulated organisms, such as salmonella. In addition, sickle cell disease can cause ischemic injury within the bowel, leading to compromise of the barrier. The end result is a greater propensity for seeding of the blood with bacteremia and osteomyelitis. Next, we have a six-year-old male with right lower quadrant abdominal pain and diarrhea. His symptoms began about one week after eating undercooked pork. He lives on a farm and has exposure to pigs as well as drinking raw milk. He has bloody diarrhea with fever, nausea, and vomiting. Specifically, he has right lower quadrant abdominal pain as well as tenderness there. He complains of sore throat and has evidence of pharyngitis. Symptoms take about two weeks to resolve. This is consistent with Yersinia enterocolitica. Similar to other cases we've covered, Yersinia can cause fever, nausea and vomiting with watery or bloody diarrhea. Yersinia can affect the mesenteric lymph nodes leading to severe right lower quadrant abdominal pain that mimics appendicitis, sometimes called pseudoappendicitis. Incubation period for this tends to be a bit longer, up to 14 days, with symptoms also lasting a little bit longer, up to about 10 to 20 days. Additionally, this can involve the lymphoid tissue, including tonsils, leading to sore throat with tonsillitis or pharyngitis. Yersinia is spread through fecal-oral route, most commonly through undercooked pork, but also potentially through contaminated milk or water. Additionally, it can spread through direct contact with animals, such as pigs or pet feces. It tends to be more severe and occur more in children as opposed to adults. Interestingly, it's uncommon in tropical countries. Important to note, it's less common than Shigella, non-typhoidal salmonella, or Campylobacter. Yersinia intercolitica is a gram-negative rod that has a predilection for the terminal ileum and right colon. Its shape is often shorter than a normal rod, and so some authors refer to it as a cacobacillus, although the separation between bacillus, or rod, and cacobacillus is not well defined. 
Like Shigella, it does not ferment lactose or produce hydrogen sulfide. One of the key virulence factors it has is its ability to capture iron. In iron overload states, Yersinia intercalitica thrives, increasing a person's susceptibility to this infection. Next, we have a case of a 58-year-old woman with bloody diarrhea. Her diarrhea began watery and then turned bloody. Symptoms began about three days after eating undercooked hamburger meat. She has associated abdominal pain, but no fever. Her symptoms resolve on their own in about seven days. This is a case of enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or EHEC. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli can be a cause of bloody diarrhea, though it can begin watery. There typically is associated abdominal pain. However, unlike many of the other causes of bloody diarrhea, does not usually cause a fever. Typical incubation period is about one to seven days with symptoms lasting about a week. It can be transmitted through fecal-oral route, including through contaminated foods such as undercooked ground beef or raw vegetables. Additionally, just like Shigella, it has a low infectious dose, making it easy to spread from person to person. EHEC can also be spread from direct contact with animals such as cattle, elk, and deer. While enterohemorrhagic E. coli can affect all ages, it tends to be more severe in young children and in the elderly. As covered in the initial flowchart, Escherichia coli is a gram-negative lactose fermenting rod of the Enterobacteraceae family, which rapidly ferments lactose, giving a vibrant pink color change on McConkie auger. E. coli is normal flora of the gastrointestinal tract. In order to become pathogenic and cause gastrointestinal disease, E. coli has to obtain virulence-associated plasmids. Plasmids are segments of extra-chromosomal DNA which are incorporated into the organism. E. coli plasmids can be acquired both by viruses, i.e. bacteriophages, or via plasmid exchange with other pathogenic E. coli. One of the features of gastrointestinal infection by E. coli is its ability to attach to the gastrointestinal epithelial cells, or enterocytes. Such an ability is plasmid encoded and is contained by various pathogenic E. coli, including enterohemorrhagic E. coli. In addition, another key plasmid-associated virulence factor seen in enterohemorrhagic E. coli is its ability to produce shigalike toxin, either Shigalike toxin 1 or Shigalike toxin 2, STX1 or STX2. Now, enterohemorrhagic E. coli Shigalike toxins work in exactly the same way as Shiga toxin produced by Shigella in that they both inhibit the 60S ribosome in enterocytes causing cell death with resultant bloody diarrhea and abdominal cramps. A key result of the production of shiga-like toxin 2 by enterohemorrhagic E. coli strains is the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. Although E. coli 0157 is the most classic strain which is associated with the development of HUS, there are some other strains that also produce shiga-like toxin 2, which can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, as you might remember from MOD, presents with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and kidney damage. The STX2 toxin causes endothelial damage to small blood vessels, resulting in microthrombi formation. Red blood cells then shear and fragment against these microthrombi. The result is that you use up platelets, causing thrombocytopenia, and that the red blood cells shear, causing anemia. The toxin also causes kidney damage with uremia, an increased level of urea in the blood. Note that HUS can also on occasion be caused by some strains of Shigella. Now when we talk about E. coli that can cause diarrhea, also referred to as pathogenic E. coli, we often break it down into different strains, as you can see outlined here. The different strains tend to act in different ways to cause varying presentations. We've already talked about enterohemorrhagic E. coli causing bloody diarrhea with a risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome in E. coli 0157. 
Enteroinvasive E. coli can cause bloody diarrhea very similar to Shigella. In fact, it has very similar genetic code to Shigella. It acts by invading the intestinal mucosa, hence the name enteroinvasive. Typically, patients begin with watery diarrhea that can turn into classic dysentery. Remember, dysentery is an invasive diarrhea associated with fever, abdominal cramps, and frequent small, bloody, mucopurulent stools. Interestingly, enteroinvasive E. coli is the only pathogenic E. coli that leads to positive fecal leukocytes. While enteroinvasive E. coli can produce a small amount of sugar toxin, we typically think of enterohemorrhagic E. coli, specifically 0157, as the primary strain of sugar toxin producing E. coli. And as we move forward today in this discussion, we will refer to sugar toxin as being associated with enterohemorrhagic E. coli. We will be discussing enterotoxigenic and enteropathogenic E. coli, both of which cause non-bloody diarrhea in our next part of this module. We will not, however, be covering enteroaggregative E. coli during this module. In our next scenario, we have a 28-year-old female with bloody diarrhea. Her symptoms began with a high fever that then developed watery diarrhea within a day or two. The watery diarrhea turned to bloody diarrhea on day two. She's had associated periumbilical abdominal pain. She's noted that the family ate grilled chicken at a picnic three days prior to the onset of symptoms, and her five-year-old son also has the same symptoms. Overall symptoms resolve within about one week. This is consistent with Campylobacter jejuni. Campylobacter jejuni is a major cause of diarrhea worldwide. In fact, it's the most common cause of community-acquired bacterial gastroenteritis in the United States. Classic presentation of Campylobacter is a prodrome of high fever and headache, followed by abdominal pain within a day or so, and then watery diarrhea that turns bloody. Typically, the incubation period is about one to seven days with symptoms lasting for about one week. Transmission for Campylobacter can occur either through fecal oral or through direct contact with animals. Uncooked poultry such as chicken is a major source. However, it can also spread through unpasteurized milk or contaminated water. Additionally, it can be spread through direct contact with animals or pets such as cats and dogs that have diarrhea. Additionally, wild birds are considered common hosts. Campylobacter is common in young children. However, interestingly, it also becomes prevalent among individuals in their 20s. Campylobacter jejuni is a gram-negative comma or S-shaped rod. It is motile, which facilitates adherence and colonization. Virulence factors include a cholera-like AB enterotoxin, which secretes sodium chloride into the bowel lumen, osmotically pulling water with it. Campylobacter jejuni isolates can also release cytotoxins that cause direct epithelial damage, which can help with invasion. The key complication associated with Campylobacter jejuni is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Although like many enteric bacteria, it is also associated with reactive arthritis or Reiter's syndrome. Remember, Guillain-Barre syndrome is an immune-mediated progressive, symmetric, ascending neuropathy, which results in marked muscle weakness and paralysis. Before we continue, let us cover Reiter's syndrome briefly. Hopefully this will be review for you. Reiter's syndrome is also known as reactive arthritis and is an immune reaction, which is triggered by certain bacteria, including chlamydia, and enteric bacteria such as Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and Yersinia. C. difficile is also a known trigger. Reiter's syndrome is much more common in individuals displaying the white blood cell antigen HLA-B27. Reiter's syndrome presents with a classic triad of conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis, often with low-grade fever. The memory device can't see for conjunctivitis, can't pee for urethritis, and can't climb a tree for arthritis is a great way to remember the disease. Now let's consider a 60-year-old man who presents with bloody diarrhea that begins shortly after returning from India, where he'd been visiting for two months. Now he is having blood and mucus in his stool with associated abdominal cramps and fever. This is a case of amoebic dysentery caused by Entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba histolytica, a protozoan parasite, is the most common cause of dysentery worldwide, though not as common in the United States. 
Although 90% of infected patients are actually asymptomatic, some can develop what is referred to as amoebic dysentery, characterized by bloody mucoid diarrhea with associated abdominal cramps. There may or may not be fever. Onset tends to be subacute, usually about one to three weeks. It's transmitted through fecal-oral route, typically with water contaminated with the cysts of Antamoeba histolytica. This is more common in resource-limited areas such as India, Africa, Mexico, and Central or South America. You can see in this picture children in India playing in water that's in close proximity to a bathroom. You may see this in patients who are migrants or travelers from endemic areas. It's important to note that it is unusual to occur in travelers who have been visiting an endemic area for less than one month. Entamoeba histolytica is a protozoan parasite whose protective cyst form is infective when ingested. Its trophozoite form is motile but very fragile in that it does not survive well outside the body and is readily destroyed by gastric acid. Although the typical presentation is that of bloody diarrhea, occasionally the trophozoites can invade the blood vessels and go to extraclonic sites where they create an abscess. The liver is the classic extraclonic site, but other organs can also be affected. Of note, a second complication of Entamoeba histolytica is bowel perforation. Entamoeba histolytica classically shows a so-called flask-shaped ulcer, seen on this section from the colon, in which the ulcer shows a base which is much broader than the surface and undermines the superficial clonic glands. Although you do not need to memorize the morphology of Entamoeba histolytica, I think it has a distinct interesting morphology which is neat to look at. A mature cyst form typically has four distinct nuclei with a prominent chromatid body. This body is made up of an aggregate of ribosomes. Although the morphology of Entamoeba histolytica is identical to the non-pathogenic Entamoeba dispar, it can be distinguished by the presence of ingested red blood cells, which speak to its pathogenic nature. Here you can find a summary table of the infectious causes of bloody diarrhea that we've covered so far. The top six are all bacteria that are gram-negative rods. The next, Campylobacter, is also a bacteria, but gram-negative, comma, or S-shaped. Lastly, we have the protozoa, Antamoeba histolytica. You can see outlined the clinical features, transmission epidemiology, and pathology features and complications. While this resource can be very valuable for studying, please remember to reference the previous slides as well for further details about these infectious causes of bloody diarrhea. Let's now consider how to approach a patient that presents with bloody diarrhea. First off, it's important to recognize that these patients always warrant workup, which begins with a stool culture and stool shigatoxin. Please note that the stool culture often takes several days to result. The stool sugar toxin assay, also referred to as a sugar-like toxin, should be ordered to identify E. coli strains such as enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157 that increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. We will discuss further in a moment why it's so important to check the sugar toxin. Again, note that while other strains of E. coli other than 0157 can produce sugar toxin, to simplify things here, we will just be focusing on enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157. Additionally, you may consider ordering a fecal leukocyte or stool lactoferrin, though this is really considered optional. These two tests are similar but not identical. While the fecal leukocyte test looks for actual white blood cells in the stool, the stool lactoferrin is a marker for fecal leukocytes. Fecal leukocytes are more likely to be present in invasive diarrhea, specifically due to Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, and enteroinvasive E. coli. They can also be present in C. diff colitis that we'll discuss later in this series. If you have additional concern for amoebiasis due to Entamoeba histolytica, you should order an ova and parasite stool test. Reasons to consider this be, would be based on travel history or bloody diarrhea with a negative fecal leukocyte test. Now, many labs are able to run a panel often referred to as a GI pathogen PCR or polymerase chain reaction, which is a type of a nucleic acid test. This test can identify the main bacterial, viral, and parasitic causes of diarrhea and includes the sugar toxin as well. 
It's a very effective test and used commonly in actual practice. However, you may not necessarily see this as an option when taking board exams. While the PCR can be very valuable, you should note that you cannot identify antimicrobial sensitivities on PCR as opposed to the stool culture. When considering treatment of bloody diarrhea, one of the key questions is always, is there a need for antibiotics? Let's walk through this. First off, cases of diarrhea, bloody and non-bloody, initially require supportive care. This is predominantly rehydration through oral fluids and occasionally IV. Next, we need to consider if the sugar toxin is present. Again, this is specifically looking for enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157, not Shigella. If the sugar toxin is present, you should not treat with antibiotics, as that can increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome in enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157. Next, assuming that the sugar toxin is negative, if the patient's having severe symptoms such as fever, need for hospitalization, or bacteremia, we should go ahead and treat with empiric antibiotics while awaiting the stool culture results. Empiric antibiotic options include azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, and levofloxacin. Now, once the stool culture and ONP, if done, are back, we can make further decisions about antibiotics as follows. First, if the patient has Shigella, Salmonella typhi, or Entamoeba histolytica, we always treat. If, however, the patient has non-typhoidal Salmonella, Yersinia, enteroinvasive E. coli, or Campylobacter, we only treat with antibiotics if the patient's having severe symptoms. Otherwise, if non-severe, it's just supportive care. While there are a number of antibiotics that can be considered for specific bacteria, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, and levofloxacin are commonly used and are the ones that I would like you to remember here. Now, if the patient has evidence of entamoeba histolytica, of course, our treatment will have to be geared towards a parasite. And in that case, we treat with a course of metronidazole followed by paramomycin. Macrolide antibiotics are the second most prescribed antibiotic in the Northern Hemisphere. They were discovered in the 1950s. Azithromycin, the structure of which is shown here, contains a macrolide ring, as do all macrolide antibiotics, to include clarithromycin, erythromycin, and our example is azithromycin. Azithromycin is a macrolide antibiotic that inhibits protein synthesis. This drug achieves this through inhibition of the 50S ribosomal subunit. A very important adverse effect includes the inhibition of cytochrome P450 drug metabolizing enzymes. This can produce a cardiac effect to include QT prolongation and so-called twisting of the points or tosa de poids. If you click on the link, the package insert will be revealed to you. With respect to the spectrum of this antibiotic, bacteria lacking cell walls, mycoplasma, legionella, and chlamydia, and some anaerobes. Pharmacokinetics, this drug is available PO or IV. You should take it on an empty stomach. A long half-life permits once daily dosing. This drug is unmetabolized and excreted 100% in bile. Undesirable side effects include GI upset, however, less frequent than erythromycin, as well as abdominal pain. Fluoroquinolones are DNA topoisomerase inhibitors and can include cipro and levofloxacin. With respect to quinolones, resistance evolves rapidly. The general mode of action of quinolone antibiotics includes interference with bacterial DNA replication and the process of transcription. Other examples of quinolones include levofloxacin, trovofloxacin, among others. All quinolones contain fused aromatic rings with a carboxylic acid group attached. These drugs can be used to treat bone and joint infections, intra-abdominal infections, infectious diarrhea, and so on. They can be used in addition to other antibiotics. They can be taken by mouth, eye drops, ear drops, or intravenously. More specifically, their mechanism of action is inhibition of DNA gyrase and DNA topoisomerase enzymes in bacteria. The mechanism of resistance to these drugs includes the increased expression of bacterial transport pumps and alterations in DNA gyrase and topoisomerase structure. GI bugs treated 
are gram-negative causes of gastroenteritis to include Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter jejuni. Several high-yield adverse reactions could include tendon damage, QT prolongation, GI upset. These drugs are contraindicated in children and pregnant women. They damage growing cartilage. Thus, there's an increased risk of aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection. Specifically for our case today, fluoroquinolones can be used in shigatoxin-negative bloody diarrhea, but they can also be used in hospital-acquired infections associated with urinary catheters and community-acquired infections. And these drugs are recommended only when risk factors for multidrug resistance are present or after another antibiotic regimen has failed. Very serious acute cases of pyelonephritis, bacterial prostatitis, and hospital acquired pneumonia. Nitroimidazole compounds refer to a class of antibiotics. They share a similar chemical structure. They're used to treat parasitic infections, amoebiasis, bacterial vaginosis, GI infections, skin infections, meningitis, lower respiratory infections, bacterial infections, diarrhea, and rosacea. Their mechanism of action include free radical formation that damages bacterial DNA. GI bugs treated with metronidazole and tenidazole include Giardia, Entamoeba histolytica, in which metronidazole is followed by Paramomycin, C. diff, Helicobacter pylori, here is an alternative look at the mechanism of action of metronidazole and tenidazole. Both of these compounds cause DNA damage. Digging deeper into nitroimidazole compounds' mechanism of action, these compounds are delivered as a prodrug that is acted upon by nitroreductase and the bacteria to convert it to its active metabolite, which is cytotoxic. This compound then binds to DNA after diffusing into the organism to inhibit protein synthesis. And it does this by causing a loss of helical DNA structure. It also causes strand breakage, and that inhibits protein synthesis by interacting with DNA. These compounds cause cell death in susceptible organisms to include obligate anaerobes, protozoans. Digging a little deeper into the mechanism of action of metronidazole, it includes the formation of free radicals which, as you can see here, cause damage to DNA, depletion of thiols, and form adducts with proteins. There are certain undesirable side effects of nitroimidazole compounds, including metronidazole and tenidazole, specifically a disulfiram-like reaction when patients consume alcohol to include flushing, vomiting, and headache. There are CNS disturbances that manifest in seizures, ataxia, and dizziness, as well as general symptoms, nausea, anorexia, bloating, and cramping. Pharmacokinetic properties of nitroimidazole compounds both come in PO or IV formulations. Both penetrate well into tissues and abscesses, as well as empyemas and cerebrospinal fluid. Metabolism is through glucuronidation, whereas the majority of the drug is eliminated unchanged in the urine. We're next going to turn our attention to a member of the aminoglycoside family, which is a rather large family of over 20 antibiotics. Their general mode of action is to inhibit synthesis of proteins by bacteria, leading to cell death. Examples include neomycin, canamycin, and paromomycin. All of these drugs contain sugar substructures. You can see that here. The most frequent clinical use of aminoglycoside antibiotics includes sepsis, intra-abdominal infections that are complicated, urinary tract infections, also complicated, and respiratory tract infections. Paramycin is specifically used for parasitic infections. In general though, once the causal organisms are grown and their susceptibilities tested, aminoglycoside antibiotics are likely discontinued in favor of less toxic antibiotics. Drilling down a little bit deeper on paromomycin, this drug is used to treat amoebiasis, giardiasis, leishmaniasis, tapeworm infection, and it's also used for clearance of cyst carriage of entamoeba histolytica. It's a protein synthesis inhibitor in non-resistant cells. It binds and alters 30S bacterial ribosomal activity, thus increasing error rate in translation. The mechanism of action against leishmaniasis infection is poorly understood. 
although it's proposed to be mediated through inhibition of parasite metabolism and inhibition of mitochondrial respiration. The mechanism of parasitic resistance is readily induced in vitro by several mechanisms, including altered membrane fluidity, decreased drug accumulation through increased expression of ABC drug efflux transporters, and the greater tolerance of parasites to host defense mechanisms. Toxicities associated with paramomycin include kidneys and ears, and this toxicity is additive. It's more likely to occur when used with other drugs that cause ear and kidney toxicity. Specifically, the concurrent use of phosphornet increases the risk of kidney toxicity. We have two additional cases of bloody diarrhea that are typical of certain specific populations. While they are important for you to recognize, we will not be going into as deep detail on them. First, we have a 45-year-old male who presents with bloody diarrhea. Importantly, he has a history of immunocompromise with HIV. He has no history of ingesting contaminated water or foods and no recent travel like you might see in other causes of bloody diarrhea, but he does have both abdominal pain and fever and his stool is grossly bloody. This is a case consistent with colitis due to cytomegalovirus, or CMV. In the immunocompromised patient, CMV can involve a number of organ systems as can be remembered with the acronym CREEP, colitis, retinitis, esophagitis, encephalitis, and pneumonitis. In the case of colitis, it can lead to bloody diarrhea with fever and abdominal pain. This can be confused clinically with ischemic colitis in older adults. Diagnosis is not through a stool test, but rather through colonoscopy and biopsy. CMV occurs as a reactivation of a previous infection of the virus, and as mentioned before, typically affects immunocompromised patients, specifically HIV patients if their CD4 counts are low, as well as organ transplant patients. Cytomegalovirus is a double-stranded DNA herpes virus. The clonic findings are very nonspecific, essentially consisting of inflamed and ulcerated clonic mucosa. The key finding is the cytopathic CMV inclusions, consisting of an enlarged nucleus with a surrounding area of clearing. Many times, the inclusions can be seen in binucleated pairs. This is one of those diseases that often appears to be looking back at you. Lastly, we have a 42-year-old woman with bloody diarrhea. She recently ate raw oysters and then developed bloody diarrhea within a day. She has associated abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, and fever, and symptoms completely resolve within five days. This case is consistent with Vibrio parahemolyticus. Vibrio parahemolyticus often causes watery diarrhea, but as its name suggests, it can also cause bloody diarrhea. There are often abdominal cramps, nausea with vomiting, and fever. The incubation period is typically brief, from 7 to 72 hours, with symptoms typically lasting only about 5 days. Most of the cases are self-limited and require only supportive care, though it can, in some cases, lead to bacteremia. It's transmitted through ingestion of undercooked seafood such as oysters, clams, shrimp, and crabs, and is common in Japan. Vibrio parahemolyticus has very similar characteristics to that of Vibrio cholera. Both are curved, comma-shaped, gram-negative bacteria with a single polar flagellum, which allows them to move through fluid. Such an ability is especially helpful for Vibrio parahemolyticus as it is found free living in marine and coastal environments. Like Vibrio cholera, it is a curved, comma-shaped, gram-negative bacteria, which although non-invasive, can attach to the bowel wall, inducing a secretory diarrhea. Here we see a scanning electron micrograph of Vibrio parahemolyticus with a single polar flagella.